Hello, podcast listener. My guest today is Raymond Rea. We get to talk about movies. We get to talk about being spies. We get to talk about uh, Italians. And I pitch a movie that is so bad, you can't wait to see it. Coming to theaters in 2020, if I have my way. Plus, I tell you about a podcast that I love to listen to because I can't stand the people in it. All of that and so much more on this episode of JJ Meets World. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode of JJ Meets World is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. Natalie has a proven track record to get your home sold faster and for more money. She is consistently focused on her clients' needs and wants throughout the entire process and make sure that they are well taken care of. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to Natalie today. On average, Natalie sells a home every 3.74 days. That's at least two a week. And last year, Natalie earned her clients on average over $4,000 above list price on their homes. And you don't have to take our word for it. Here's some of the great reviews Natalie has received. I was overwhelmingly impressed with Natalie and all the hatch team. She was very responsive and responded to all of the emails within an hour. She gave great advice and encouragement from the listing and pictures, the offer and all the closing details. The marketing team knew exactly how to promote my property and I was pleased by how soon and easily my property received an offer. I was actually dreading selling my condo and Natalie did such an awesome job that I felt like I really didn't need to do anything. The thing I most appreciated was that she really listened to what I wanted to do and respected my decisions. I would definitely recommend Natalie and all all the Hatch Realty team, they made this process so wonderful. That was from Diane. So listen, if you're in the mood to buy or sell a home, give Natalie a call right now. You can reach her at 701-388-9338. Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E at HatchRealtyFM.com. Or you can go to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's Live. FargoMoorhead.com and find out some information. Huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring JJ Meets World. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. I listen to several podcasts outside of JJ Meets World. Of course, JJ Meets Real is my favorite, and if you want to go review it, we appreciate that. And don't just review it on iTunes, review it on Spotify, all the places where you consume podcasts that you love. But I listened to one called Now Playing, and it's three guys who review movies, and they do a lot of due diligence before they review a movie. They watch it, then they watch it again with an audio commentary, and then they watch it uh, with, you know, like a pop-up, you know, piece about it. They'll read articles from the time a movie was released, if it's older. They'll read uh, sections of books. When they did the Super Mario Brothers, they read John Leguizamo's autobiography because he has two chapters where he talks about making Super Mario Brothers the movie. And I can't stand any of the guys who are in this podcast. I disagree with them wholeheartedly. Uh, Sometimes they get lost in the silliest of plot moments, but I cannot stop listening to this podcast. I don't know what it is about it. And I think if, if I had to break it down, if I really had to think, but I don't know if this is certain, I think it's because I love movies so much. I want to just talk about movies all the time. And they're providing me a conversation, even though it's a one-sided conversation, to be able to get into the plot of some of these movies. And one of the reasons I like now playing is they tackle movies that not everyone is reviewing. Mm-hmm. So, for example, they did all of the Children of the Corn movies. All of them. Huh? All How many are them. there? I think there's six. And then a remake that was on sci-fi. That's a lot of Children of Corn. It's so much, especially because only one of them was a theatrical release. I just listened to the, the today when they're talking about it, but there is something about the difference between talking about movies and then a movie critique. So uh, in this podcast with our guest, Raymond Rea, we talk about 
review just movie talk Mm -hmm. and and your opinions when it comes to it uh i can't wait for you guys to find out what (laughs) film series is one of (laughs) the guilty pleasures we bring up (laughs) this podcast (laughs) because you're not gonna see it coming i had no idea that that raymond was into those movies no no isn't that amazing like yeah so uh, but it really got me to think like oh okay so we can talk about that my guard is down because so many times people judge other people on the movies that they like. And it's just not it, whatever floats your boat, whatever melts your butter, right? Whatever skips your stone. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a, a little idiom yet, but I want it to be. It skips is now. Your stone. Whatever it skips is now. your stone. Uh, this conversation is amazing. We talk about uh, being a double agent spy. We talk, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talk about uh, making movies as an art form versus making movies as a business. I get to pitch one of the best worst ideas I've ever had for a movie ever. And it is one of the most insightful conversations I think we've had on JJ meets world. We talk a lot about education too. Um, uh, Raymond is a film professor. And so just, just the, the, the way uh, how the educational system in higher ed works, how there's sort of a ranking system and how uh, for a, a teacher of film, uh, you might not have a ton of options uh, that that other, other groups might have. Plus you get a great uh, piece of insight about if you're ever quizzed of what, of if you're from Boston or not. Yes. Uh, that'll make more sense in about 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Spoiler alert. <laughs> if you're not from Boston, don't say you're from Boston. <laughs> uh, Folks, strap in and enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World with our special guest, Raymond Rea. JJ Meets World. Raymond, Sounds how do you pronounce your last name for me? Rea. Rea. Yeah. You. Three letters and two syllables. It's, <laughs> it's confusing to a lot of people. Because <laughs> it can easily be just read as Ray. And it was, it was Americanized to being Ray. So okay. I'm doing sort of a, a version of an obnoxious third generation, well, second generation Italian American thing, which is I am reclaiming the original pronunciation where, you know, my dad, who was called WAP in high school a whole lot, uh, made it a point to not have an Italian sounding wow. last name. So easy for me to say, right? Like easy for me to have an Italian sounding last name. So in your third generation? I am boat? second generation okay. on that side. My dad's first generation. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. But on my mom's side here forever. Got it. So, uh, you know, taking into that. So Gordon is I'm Scottish on both sides. <laughs> and is it interesting how, we have the cruelty for certain countries, like where you're from in Europe. Like I never hear anybody talking down about the Scots. I never hear, <laughs> but I hear people talking down about the Irish all right. the time. Right. And what's going on in our world where we decide that it's all right to pick and choose different areas to segregate and be just awful to. Yeah. It's, I wish I knew the answer. I think the the thing with the Irish was just um, about immigration, possibly. You know, like after the potato famine, so many boatloads of Irish people were coming over here under terrible conditions. So people dying going across the Atlantic. But all of a sudden, there was this enormous influx of Irish people into the States. And, you know, just like... You know, any other refugee influx today, uh, people weren't happy about that many people showing up at the same time. It's this, so. it's this weird recurring hypocrisy, like specifically an American hypocrisy, where right. descendants of immigrants see themselves as being the rightful owners of this place that they were born finding themselves in and right. the and the the immigrants that are coming after them well they're the interlopers right they're right they're the ones and so even with the irish they had people who were already you know they, they're you you cannot be someone unless you are uh, of native american ancestry to claim that you that this was just where you right. were i mean essentially yeah. it's all immigration yeah it's such a strange but it's seemingly uniquely American hypocrisy that seems yeah. to come up every every group of new Americans yeah. that come over. And yet also, you know, here in the States, people 
love claiming that they're Irish or Italian when they're actually Irish American or Italian American. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go over to Ireland or Italy, people will say, no, no, you're not Irish. You're not Mm -hmm. Italian. You know, uh, you're American. So it's really, you know, why not acknowledge that? Yeah, as you said, unless you're First Nation, unless you're Native American, uh, you you aren't from here, and right. we're all not from here. And, uh, and as and as though like me, you know, waking up one day realizing I was born here, that that somehow makes me special, or that I've I earned it, right? right? This is mine because I I found myself here through no choice of my own, right? right? And that means this is mine. And oh, you you chose to come here. Well, it's not yours, right? Which right. shouldn't that be the opposite? <laughs> like, you know, right. if you actually consciously made a decision to be someplace that's has a little bit more intent behind it than right. just being born something or someone. So I'm a big fan of buffets that have a little bit of everything, <laughs> and I think that maybe if we just got Americans to think of immigration more like a buffet. <laughs> They would be all about it because they'd be like, you're going to have your pizza and you're going to have your potatoes and you're going to have your wontons and together you're going to have this massive hillock glop of food that you're going to love and you're just going to get obese on it. Welcome to America. I can I can definitely tell you from working for like six years in poker television, going to so many casino buffets. There are plenty of Americans at casino buffets who I guarantee you do not have progressive views on immigration. They, they're not, they're, <laughs> they do they're, not. They're not, they're not pondering uh, and, race relations. And they, they're the ones who need the message. So I agree with you. Let's target buffets to get that messaging at because you and Walmarts. <laughs> uh-huh. And yeah, they're everywhere. You know what we should do is we should hire somebody whose sole purpose is to interview someone before they go into a buffet. Yes. And so when they get in, you know, find out how scummy of a human being they are when they go in and they try and grab you know like german bratwurst and they're like nope you're not allowed you not. you can't have any of this because you are a bad person that people you're judging other cultures so you're not going to enjoy this delicious <laughs> blood sausage yeah. by the way you're also going to be excluded from all of this stuff and ice cream didn't come from the united states either so you can't have ice cream to wash it down with yeah some i'm all for that idea somehow i think uh possibly having staged actors leafleting <laughs> at buffet tables <laughs> might not you know really go over well with the casinos but you know could be a subversive action yeah. at some point just standing there slapping hands so i've seen so many buffets that divide their the cuisine in in by cut country you know or, or mm-hmm. ethnicity but i would love to see like a buffet where it's like here's a little taste of south dakota mm-hmm. here's some california right and 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 divide it up in in, in those lines. As long um, as it's all deep fried, though. Yes. I mean, I oh, think, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, deep fried California, <laughs> deep fried South Dakota, right, right. freedom fries. There you go. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, Raymond. Uh, I want to start by first talking a little bit about filmmaking, mm-hmm. and uh, I understand that that's a passion of yours. Yeah. Yeah, it's been something that I've probably been doing since I was 13 uh, with my friend Super 8 Camera. You know, (laughs) isn't that, that is one of those stories where you hear all of these filmmakers talk about their Super 8 (laughs) <laughs> beginnings so much so that like steven spielberg still talks fondly of the time he made his first super eight film and you know we don't have that experience so much anymore right. like kids growing up today they've got a camera in their pocket you can only imagine what filmmakers in the 40s and 50s would think if they could just pull something out of their pocket and shoot yeah. straight for an hour if they really wanted to yeah um do you uh when you first got into it there still were places where you could get it developed. The film right. was there. The stock was there. The equipment was there. Right. Um, how, how did you guys first get your hands on it? Uh, good question. I'm <laughs> trying to remember that. I think um, you could buy it at a drugstore, oh, I yeah? want to say. Uh, just like you could buy 35 millimeter you know, rolls of photography film, I think, you know, Super 8 film used to come in these little cassettes uh, that were much like 35 millimeter film. You would just rip them open, put them in the camera. Um, Super 8 sound was actually the same way. It would come in a cassette 
only the undeveloped film also had a tiny, tiny little magnetic stripe uh, along the side of it that would be recorded on a separate microphone. That was like a fancy camera for kids. So yeah. <laughs> we didn't have one of those. We just had, you know, the regular Super 8. But, you know, still to this day, I mean, I'm geeky enough and nerdy enough about 16 millimeter that I still shoot 16 millimeter today. Um, so I still shoot, you know, film that you have to buy from Kodak and send to a lab and, you know, have that moment of suspense after you've shot where you've got no idea if you just wasted all of your time or, you know, if there's something good there. So. Yeah, was was someone monitoring the light? Was someone <laughs> monitoring the light? Did we take a reading? <laughs> um, uh, not a lot of film processing uh, businesses left in the United States, so you're no. you're sending it off yep. in the mail to somewhere, and how long are you waiting for it to come back? Uh, usually about a week and a half, two weeks. Wow. Yeah, but there are specifically very few places that do sixteen millimeter black and white. Um, I know of two, I want to say, and one, which I won't name here, is pretty <laughs> god awful. <laughs> so I always go to the other one. So, yeah. Um, are you getting back the developed film and are you working with that or are you getting back a digital scan yeah, of you it? You can do either. Uh, for my part, I always get the digital. Uh, there's, I mean, there used to be these big ungainly devices called flatbeds, uh, that you would put 16 millimeter on and run it through. There was a little bit of a viewer window, um, and you could edit film that way. Um, <clears throat> we don't have, I mean, I don't have one and frankly, I don't, most people who are shooting 16 millimeter now transfer it into a digital environment and then edit on digital. When I went to film school, they were just getting rid of those machines. They were yeah. literally like just pulling them out and th putting them in the back alley, waiting for someone yeah, to, that to junk them. Yeah. And they were replaced with a, a sea of IMAX. That's right. Instead. And I remember a couple of my film teachers who were, who had re retired from the filmmaking industry to come teach it was it was like pulling the streetcars out of St. Paul, Minnesota. They yep. just, you know, they're waving goodbye to an era. Yep. And they said, but there's really no point in it because you're never going to go get a job at Warner Brothers and they're going to give you a stack of celluloid and be like, all right, it's, you know, it's time to cut. You know, you're going to sit in an edit room right. for a while. They want to teach you what it's going to be like to work in the industry. Right. And I will also say this, you know, we no longer... Uh, go outside to poop in a little outhouse. And <laughs> you, so time, you might no, may no longer do that. <laughs> Speak for yourself, JJ. <laughs> Times they are a changing, but it, my opinion is there is an art form to cutting celluloid film that I think makes people a little more cautious. Like um, you measure twice, cut once is what they say in the construction industry. And nowadays when you can just, you know, undo, you can save the file a million times there. I don't think the, the, the editing process is as intentional to people who've never had to actually slice yeah. and tape because you can, you can tape it back together, but you can only do it so many times before you start to like really ruin that little cut mark right there. Yeah, although I got to say that's mostly true if you shoot reversal. Uh, so if you shoot reversal film stock, then what you get back from the lab is what actually went through the camera. So you only get one. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're shooting any type of negative, I mean, it does cost something. But if you shoot on negative and you edit on 16 millimeter, what you're editing is a print. And if you really mess it up <laughs> after a while in the edit, <laughs> there's a possibility of getting a second print and starting again although most people don't wouldn't do that even in the ancient days of flatbeds and so, at that point they're just like it's good enough they're just you know i think i know so many filmmakers who edit on flatbeds who were like would rationalize you know would be like no i i like it that way <laughs> you know i yes that's all i think that's deliberate you know uh and that just you know it was 
tons and tons of really what you are saying, like, that's ah, good enough, but put differently put a little bit differently sure so So what kind of what kind of films are you working on right now um i as i said i'm i'm working on i'm finishing tinkering with uh interactive documentary project that will end up on a website it's actually up on on my website right now um and that project is, and I'm almost hesitant to say this because I've gone around this material so many times, but it is also about my Italian grandfather's immigration, uh, just because it's so interesting. I mean, he was uh, a foreign correspondent for an Italian paper, and so he was stationed in this country as a foreign correspondent. And then he petitioned the government to stay here. You know, at the same time that all of the rest of the Italian journalists were being sent back. So, because he petitioned to stay here, there's this whole group of letters that the government had kind of debating whether he was a spy or not. Um, oh. so I, <laughs> right. So That's a twist. <laughs> it, it, yeah. And then, yeah, and I got these letters by contacting the federal government through the Freedom of Information Act. And um, so, you know, there's a letter about my grandfather signed by J. Edgar Hoover and, you know, the Secretary of State and all of that at the very beginning of the FBI. And then Hoover's letter, interestingly enough, actually make some suggestion about the fact that possibly my grandfather actually volunteered to spy on the Italians uh, since. So anyway, he found himself in this pretty unique position of being able to be like a qualified double agent, you know? So, 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 you know, on, in my own life, researching my own family, my grandparents and great grandparents, I've been fascinated by that for my own story and have not come into any twists like what you're talking about. And the sense when I'm doing it is that I'm learning more about myself and my own family history. And it's it's like more pieces of the puzzle are coming together. So what does it feel like for you, uh, you know, just, just to, to find these old papers that, that tell more of the story about how you came to be here. Yeah, it's, it's mixed. (laughs) You know, I feel like it's mixed because uh, you know, the question of he was whether he was a spy was really a question of whether he sided with Mussolini, which the Italian government was at the time. So this government, the American government, was trying to figure out if he was a fascist or not. Yeah. And I have to say, uh, ironically, this was at a time where the, the American government was anti-fascist, right? So, uh, oh, the good old days. <laughs> obviously, obviously anti-fascist. So, but you know, I've heard from my grandmother and from my father forever that he was anti-fascist, and that's why he wanted to leave. But you know, just digging back through all these old letters, and you know, him himself seeming to propose to be a double agent it really seems like he was pretty mercenary you know on some level uh politically although very much in love with this country so um so it's just you know getting that more information i mean i really appreciate him he was stationed all over the world he was stationed in london he was stationed in asia um he was i've seen his passport and it was all over the world um but you know when he petitioned to stay here the interesting thing is there's not one letter from him you know, in that box of letters. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a letter, there's a couple letters from my grandmother, uh, his wife, who, and so my father, she became, she was pregnant with my father when my grandfather and my grandmother were traveling back and forth across the Atlantic. But, you know, they very deliberately had my father born here. So he would be a United States citizen, but then they went back to Italy and he partly grew up there. So just that whole question of who gets to be a citizen, who doesn't uh, even back then was 
really contentious, I think. And, you know, and this is, you know, honestly, my grandfather's experience was privileged in a certain sense, very different than, you know, boatloads of Italians coming across the ocean and just going right through Ellis Island. So Raymond, you, you wrote this amazing play that we had the privilege of staging at theater B a number of years ago um, called uh, the sweet new. Was that the correct right. title of it? Yeah. And um, I think your, your grandfather's experiences are uh, one of the characters in that show is dealing with yeah. changing nationality and stuff like that. So, I mean, was it, I'm trying to remember now, some moments in that show where the character who I believe was the stand in for your grandfather is being questioned by like a government authority. Right. So how much of this did you know about when you were writing that play? I knew a bunch of it. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't have that uh, sheaf of documents from the government. Uh, when I was writing that play. So I was really, when I wrote The Sweet New, going more on family lore. Gotcha. And that's really interesting, I think, to me. Like, the way that our families reframe the memory, you know, of what happened to them. And then we've got nothing else to go on. <laughs> you know, right. we really just have to believe them. So, um and I had a letter, so my godfather was Sal Dusabella, who shows up in that play. Gotcha. And uh, so, Sal Dusabella was uh, an Italian-American FBI man uh, who was basically investigating my grandfather, and then they became friends. Uh, so, you know, it's just a weird history. <laughs> so... Yeah. yeah, you know, history is a, a living, breathing thing, in my opinion. Yeah, and history changes quite a bit as the stories get retold over and over and over again. You know, what started out as a a three inch fish becomes a three foot fish by the time the grandson, great grandson, is told uh, a story. Right. And I I always appreciate the fact when people do the due diligence to dig back and find out, you know, like, okay, so let me separate part of fact from fiction. Um, I'm in a weird process right now because my grandmother was friendly with Richard Nixon and she's got correspondence with, uh, with vice president Nixon at the time from when he came to visit Fargo. And she was one of the, the hostesses, who hosted wow. him when he was here. And I, you know, reading these letters, cause you know, at this point I grew up where Richard Nixon was a villain. My, right. enti my entire life, like that's the, what's been portrayed as who Richard Nixon was, was this ma major villain and a crook. Right. But you know, reading these letters, there's a lot of great humanity in them. And he, he's funny in the letters. He's actually pretty witty when it comes down to it. Right. And so that shakes up my, you know my my feelings on on my grandmother knowing this yeah. particular man who became president yeah and it's it, i like i just bought a book recently which is the love letters that he and his wife wrote back and forth oh. to each other yeah. and that's amazing like i didn't know this did you know that he met pat nixon because they did summer stock theater together no yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Richard Dixon in a play? <laughs> it's like Richard the Third. <laughs> like it's now was the winter of our this <laughs> uh, just so like a flop sweat the whole time when he's on stage. But uh so it's caused me to do this little th this tr trip through history and to kind of learn more about the things that I've just sort of been spoon fed and right. glossed over. You know, I believe Richard Nixon was probably a paragraph and a half in my high school history book. Sure. And that's where we ended. Sure. You know, I was like, Nope, Nick, the Nixon Watergate scandal. And then, you know, you'll get, you listen to the Billy Joel song and you guys sure. can pick up the rest of what history <laughs> has had. Uh, so I find it to be just an intriguing thing as stories change and morph and finding the truth and finding out that, the reason it changes is because truth is easier to to swallow than fiction uh, in some cases, but then most of the time, a little bit of embellishment turns yeah. things into a legend. You know, the the story of Paul Bunyan probably started as there was just a really tall guy who was a lumberjack, right? But you don't really want to read about a tall lumberjack. <laughs> and like, he had a big cow. He had a big cow. Yeah. But now it's it so blue. much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so much better to hear the legend. Yeah. Um. 
<laughs> so it, going back to, to filmmaking, so yep. it, did you follow your passion throughout life? Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. I uh, got a little bit distracted. Um, I uh, For a while there in the early 80s, I uh, was out in California and I was bartending in <clears throat> a small punk club. Um, so a, a real dive, I mean, something, it was known as a dive, it was, you know, completely painted black and the floors were sticky and, you know, the door down to the basement where the beer was, was in the back of the stage. So, you know, <laughs> bands would, terrible bands, like anybody could play there would come and be playing on the stage. <laughs> and the owner of the bar, Celso, who was like a little old Filipino man, would be seen kind of making his way across the stage to go downstairs to the basement and then coming back upstairs, hauling cases of Budweiser. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we only sold like one type of beer, Budweiser, and the music was so loud that you're not going to be able to see me doing this on a podcast, but basically bartending involved people coming to the bar and holding up how many fingers they wanted mm. for how many beers they wanted. So, so I did, and it was just a really exciting time. Uh, there was like a lot going on. Uh, in that scene so i made uh a couple of little like 100 foot films back then but to be honest now i look back on that time i was like eh, i should have like made more film uh but i didn't really like start making films again until uh the 90s until like the mid 90s so. and so you are you you're are you from this air, uh, area originally? Are you from the Upper Midwest originally? No, uh, I actually grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up about twenty miles outside of Boston, uh, in what is now definitely a bedroom community for Boston. At the time, it was actually kind of exurb instead of suburb. It was. Uh, it felt like just a small town. Uh, now it's, you know, I could never afford to go back and live in the town I grew up in at this point. Um, but then I moved out to California and lived there for about 18 years. So, uh, so that became uh, kind of a second home as well. Did you ever have that like Boston accent? No. Because I you not. like, I don't hear it at all. No, although when I get when I go back there, uh, it start I start <laughs> to pick it up a little bit. But I didn't I didn't grow up with it. No, it's not. You know, it's funny because when you're from the Boston area, you say you're from the Boston area, but you don't say you're from Boston. Right? You know, like that's <laughs> there. That's very serious. Uh, if you did that, that would be a huge encroachment on civility in some level. Wow. So you know, and it's funny because I have gotten off at the Logan Airport and ridden the shuttle uh, many, many times. And the last time I was on the shuttle, somebody from somewhere totally outside of like never been in massachusetts before uh approached me and were like are you from boston uh really just want to know which stop to get off on the shuttle and my first reaction i was like no no i'm not <laughs> from boston you know like feeling like i was being given a quiz and i didn't want to use the wrong answer there <laughs> um but yeah so the Boston accent, though, does go out into the suburbs. I probably don't have it because my parents didn't have it. Uh, both of my parents uh, actually grew up in New York City. Um, and then we moved up to Massachusetts. So. Uh, I've been to Boston once, but I lived in Chicago for a long time. Mm -hmm. And Chicago is very specific to its neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Chicago and they say, are you from Chicago? No one says they're really from Chicago. They say, oh, I'm from the Gold Coast or, you mm -hmm. know, I'm from uh, the Loop. I'm from South. I'm from Lincoln. Um, and I find it, it 
I find it so interesting how each city has a personality like that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm Queens, you know, you like what borough mm. and uh, how people identify with certain aspects yeah. of that, of that area. Yeah. Um, when you, uh, this community that you, you grew up in uh, outside of Boston, was it, it, it heavily Italian? Did your grandfather make like a choice like that or? No, no. Uh, actually the town that I grew up in was pretty darn waspy, you know, mm-hmm. as New England town. Uh, my dad, you know, my dad parents, my grandfather originally uh, was in Queens and then in uh, Long Island, uh, in Huntington, Long Island, um, but right around the New York City area. I think at the end of his life, he was in uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut, which, if you've ever been there, like does have like a really solid Italian. You can find, you know, like Italian bakeries, Italian delis, all that kind of stuff there. Um, my dad uh, moved. My dad was an electrical engineer, so basically he moved to the part of Massachusetts we were in for work, uh, right around that whole Route One Twenty Eight circle. There's any number of technology. So, 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 how do you end up in Fargo Moorhead? <laughs> Good question. Uh-huh. Uh, I, being a professor. Um, I wanted a tenure track job. I was actually adjuncting back in San Francisco. Um, But, you know, there's something in academia where you basically have a rank (laughs) and your rank translates nationwide. So at some point, if you want to jump rank, you have to do a nationwide search for a new position. And I really wanted a tenure track position. I was really over adjuncting in the sense that to do that, you do the vast majority of the hard work and you've got, no contribution into decision making so yeah so that's uh and you know in my area in film uh tenure track jobs are basically not existing any longer um in film it's really really common for universities to you know just hire uh industry professionals uh like without any degree and just take those on why is that well i think it's demand right you know i think a lot of students are interested in especially the industry right you know like i am not an industry filmmaker i have worked as a production coordinator uh which and i've worked on camera crews like i've worked on 35 millimeter camera crews um but i wouldn't consider myself for my own work to be an industry filmmaker i mean i make like really quirky little experimental films you know so um it's just i mean the film industry um tends to feed itself right so there are definitely some universities that are all about making more traditional work and gearing students to get into the industry and then there are some universities that are more about a student generating their own voice okay. as an artist and some of some universities who are mixed. Um, I think MSUM, I think our film program there actually does a really good job of allowing students to choose their own path uh, while learning a lot of technology at the same time. I know one thing that when someone, a younger person in high school tells me they want to go into film, my suggestion is like, absolutely, you should get started right away. And you should also study something else that you can bring into that film world. Yeah. You know, I, I know that the desire is there to just load up with nothing but film classes, film theory and page to screen. I know what an aspect ratio right. is. Right. But I, I think that some of the best filmmakers come from a place where they learned something else that they brought with them into that arena. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, well, well rounded, I guess, is the, the term that a lot of guidance counselors use. Yeah. But I always say, like, you know, what, and what's your point of view? You know, like, are you discovering what your point of view is? You know, what, what do you want to make? Because there's a difference between, between somebody who wants to make a movie that uh, is a funny YouTube thing that's going to get 10 million views and somebody who has um, something to say. And this is a way that they can reach a mass audience yeah. to tell that particular viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and I feel this all the time teaching people film production. I think, you know, really the way to learn film is you've got an idea that's just burning a hole in your head that can only be effectively done as a film or as a video, you know? And if that's your case, then you're going to find a way to do that. Um, <clears throat> what I think is less likely to happen is that, you know, you're just somebody who, likes watching movies or likes watching episodic TV, um, but you've got no real ideas of your own and uh, you think going through a film program is going to give you those ideas. Um, I think that can happen. You know, we do encourage people to think creatively, but honestly, it's hard. It's hard to teach that part, right? I, I feel like it's hard to teach that part. Like I am always appreciative of people who just have like a fire under them. And it's not just about, I like the movies. It's about, I have this idea, this one idea usually that can only be through film, you know? When I went to film school on the second day of my, uh, a class I took about screenwriting, I instantly knew that, I did not belong in film school, <laughs> at least this particular one, because we went around and everyone said, who is your favorite director and what kind of a movie do you want to make? And so we had people who, uh, you know, talk, talked about a, a, a filmmaker from Austria and this one particular film that they saw, and that's who they want to be. And then the people, kids want to be Quentin Tarantino and they wanted to make something that's going to, you know, shock people. And then it gets down to me and I said, I would like to be like Joe Dante, the director of Gremlins and Explorers, because <laughs> those movies captivate my imagination. Cricket, cricket, <laughs> cricket. And I remember we were given a task of going home, watching a movie, and then giving just a, a two-sentence review of the movie. And so I went home, and I watched Back to the Future, and I gave a two-sentence review of Back to the Future, and... My film, the, the, t the teacher of the class said, you should have picked something where you could have said something with your review. And mm. I'm like, I think I did, because that was one of the highest grossing films of the year it came out. And it really, I think, captivated a lot of people's imagination. But then when I heard about the films that everyone else is doing, you know, it, 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 Fellini and uh, German expressionism. And I'm like, oh, that's what you're looking for. Well, there. yeah, that. OK, I'm. I'm with you on that as well. Like there is uh, some level of snobbery in some film schools around mm -hmm. that. Um, personally, I think so. I mean, I make quirky little experimental films, but I, I don't know if I can say this. I basically consider myself to be a film slut on some level mm. in the sense that I will go see almost anything in a movie theater, you know? Sure. And I feel you like you have that in common. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. Just that experience of like sitting in a theater, watching something up on a big screen. We just became best friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm not a snob in that way. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I I love some of the, like um, I I it, thinking of some of the like movies that like really captured my attention. Um, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna forget that what the the Cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Yeah. Uh, I I watch that w once a year, and that's a movie that if you ask the Joe Joe Schmo out there, they'd have no idea what they're talking about. I'm like, it is a scary movie in the way it's shot, and so then when. Uh, the saddest music in the world came out. Did you ever see that one? I have not seen that. It, it, oh, 
<laughs> they do such a great job mimicking that style of filmmaking okay. where it feels very claustrophobic and you never actually light the entire set. It's sort of kind of like there's constantly this iris in iris out effect. And okay. uh, I dig that. But then I can also go and watch the latest Kurt Russell rom-com right. and find something enjoyable in that. And right. that was the thing that I kind of, the, the disappointment for me in this particular instance is I went there and I said, well, you're downplaying something because you think it's commercial. You do not think there is enough artistry going into this, but I guarantee you there is at least one person who worked on this film who put their heart and soul right. into this. It may have been a paycheck for uh, the first AD. It may have been a contract fulfillment for one of the actors, mm -hmm. but down the line, you're going to find somebody who really felt passion about this project. And well, so yeah. you should uh, you should give them the benefit of at least watching it. Yeah, and it's I mean, honestly, anything uh I think and I think anything that becomes a major motion picture uh has to have some level of skill to it and you know, I just what I don't like about this whole question about, you know, film as art or film as business is that it really feels like you have to choose a side right you mm -hmm. know and i just have never been able to do that i mean very much in my own work it's about film as art but i have you know uh any number of kind of somewhat guilty self-indulgences <laughs> in film as business like you know True confession, I am a big fan of the Fast and Furious franchise. Um, it is nothing like the films that I make, like probably polar opposite of the films that I make. And yet I'll go see every single one of those that comes out. And then how I, do you feel about Hobbs and Shaw? Then? I haven't seen that yet. Okay. okay. I, that is on my list. Yeah. Cause I did see, you know, some, you know, reading the internet, you see some blip, maybe this is a true story or not that there was dissension among some of the people who are part of the original franchise that why are you making this movie that's separate. off to the side of it that's separate i yeah. think someone accused the rock of breaking up the family uh -huh. or something like that well, i think it was tyrese gibson wasn't it yeah i think so uh, and he was probably taking his cue from uh vin diesel right 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 so uh. <laughs> but doesn't that make it all the more intriguing <laughs> like when it boils down to it um i just love the fact that what started as a car racing franchise right has now got the rock and Jason Statham fighting a totally souped up Idris Elba on the back of like a running right. with a tank and, right. and other stuff. And I'm like, is this, is this about car racing? Mm -hmm. yeah, tank, was tank was fast. Vehicle seven, okay. pornography. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm getting my timelines mixed up. Uh, one of, uh, one of my guiltiest pleasures of all time is they made a movie out of the a team television series oh, wow. from years ago yeah. <laughs> oh i must have <laughs> gone to see that thing five times in the theaters it was and there's nothing about it that would make me say like oh you should go home and seek this movie out it's not a good movie right. it's poorly written <laughs> right. it's you know the the action sequences are overly you know just over the top right. but the chemistry between those four main cast members <laughs> yeah I make it so much fun sure. to just watch. Sure. And sometimes I, th I, when I go to a movie, I want to get lost in it. Right. Which is one of the reasons why cell phone technology is great. We do a lot with it, but it has ruined part of the movie going experience for me. Yes. Oh, I can't tell you the number of times, you know, some things are, they're so smart and they look at it in their breast pocket and they don't think it'll shine a light anywhere, but if it catches my gaze, it instantly pulls me out of that right. moment. Because I love sitting in the theater. I love the lights going down. Me too. Um, the communal experience yep. is also really important to me to find yep. out, gosh, that person thinks this line's really, really funny. Right. Exactly. Um, and so I, I just went and saw uh, It Chapter 2. Oh, I haven't theaters. seen that. Yeah. And I love going to a scary movie when I can see you know, parts of popcorn buckets fly up right. in the air right. and you know, someone actually screams in the theater right. and that gets me into a movie. Like there's no tomorrow. I right. think it's one of the reasons I like going to plays as well right. is 
uh, when I, I, I went and saw Doug Hamilton, who was just on our podcast not too long ago, um, in Tuesdays with Maury, <laughs> and I sat next to Doug's son, and in it, you watch Maury pass away, and watching his son watch his dad pass away on stage made it all the more powerful. Yep. And I just, I, yeah. I love that experience. No, there's something so powerful about that. And especially if, and I know both of you have had this experience as well, but if you've worked behind the scenes to create a play or to um, create a movie, and then you watch that play or that movie from the audience, there is nothing more rewarding than, you know, somebody saying a line that you wrote or that you directed and hearing an entire audience breathe in and just hold their breath for a couple seconds and then release it. You know, it's just that sort of mass reaction to something, especially in theater, I think, that just because it's live uh, and it could be different every single night, that really can't be beat. There's the potential for a type of connection in theater specifically that no other art form that I've been able to experience seems to be able to replicate, even live arts, other types of art that have their own experiences that are unique to them. But I've had moments either acting on stage or watching a play from the audience where you achieve a type of connection where you you realize in the moment, moment this is ephemeral and it's about to go away the, the moment the lights come back up. And we won't be able to replicate specifically this moment ever again. Right. You know, I have there are movies that I watch over and over all the time that have moments that are really, really important to me that I internalize in some way, and and mm. I can replicate that whenever I want. Um, one of our first interviews we had on the show was Rich Summer from Mad Men, mm. um, who was a Concordia grad, and we had him and David Winterstein on. And Rich talked about uh, watching a production of Equus at Concordia mm. and how it moved him and how it it informed his decision to go into this full time wow. going forward. And um, I don't think I've had a moment like that. in know it where, where at least for me where I was watching a movie and I had that sort of that kind of a connection to it. And I think part of it is that electricity between the live performers feeling something and you feeling something 10 feet away from them. And yeah. you know that that feeling is going to yeah. evaporate once the lights go up. Yeah. No theater definitely has that. I think, um, yeah, I I actually wanted to do theater kind of more before I got into film. I think what happened to me around film, though, is that, you know, being in this really kind of small town environment in Massachusetts, the theater that I was seeing was like, you know, high school performances. But I had this one really inspiring theater teacher in high school who would bring in these sort of rare films. Like he brought in um, Shape of Things to Come or he brought in like Jean Cocteau's films and Orpheus. And so when I saw those, it was just not only having those types of moments where there was this real connection to what was going on on screen but it was also like you know coming from out there <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it was really coming from you know that there was something outside of my small town that i really wanted to go find and i wanted to go explore and so that really set me off you know just wanted to have adventures <laughs> so yeah let me pitch you a movie idea okay yeah so uh, full disclosure, I'm the guy who's going to make the, the popcorn movies that uh, will allow me to do other stuff later on, right? Cool. So that's that's the student I want you to envision right here. Mm -hmm. The kid who knows you got to make the commercial thing to do the passion project. So this is my commercial thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Big, huge, just enormous windows, middle of the night. So it's casting light through the windows, pale, but then these shadow areas. And you see a man who is obviously part of the Catholic Church, and he's running down the hallway, running, running, running. It shows, like, the bottom of his robe, and his I rosary beads one. are slapping <laughs> against his thighs. He's going, going. He finally gets to this big door. Pound, 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 pound on the door. Signore, signore. And the door opens, and it's a younger 
uh, younger man than you'd expect, but it's clearly the Pope. Mm-hmm. So it's a Pope, but a younger Pope. Like imagine Andy Garcia <laughs> as a Pope, right? Nice. And they there's they speak back and forth in Italian and you find out that there's been an accident. And so the Pope has to fly to the United States because his brother who married an American girl was killed in a car accident. So oh. the Pope's brother and his sister-in-law have been killed in this car accident. Okay. And so he has to be the temporary guardian for their three children. Their three American children. Oh, God. And so he has no choice but to bring them back to the Vatican City. <laughs> and it's what does the Pope do when he has to be a father? Because he's never known what it's like to have a family like this. And there's an evil cardinal who wants to, you know, to push out the Pope. And this is his opportunity because he's losing sight of, of his papal duties. And so it's, so it's a family comedy, but get this. I already have the title. Our father. <laughs> Signed, sealed, delivered. You could make that thing for probably 10 million bucks. It would probably do pretty well if you release it in October for families. Okay. So give me some notes. (laughs) Well, good. Yeah. So hard to frame comedy. That would be a good one. Uh, I think I'm seeing three kids sort of uh, wise, but uh, sentimental older sister uh a sort of a punk fuck up middle brother yep. who keeps getting into trouble and a very sweet adorable kid sister <laughs> who tags along to everything exactly uh, it's the kid the uncle sister buck trio if uncle you will buck trio. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the kid sister who has that final plot point to moment at the end of the film where she and the pope are leaning together and there's a moment of actual transcendent love you know mm-hmm. and then you know at that same point the cardinal might pop his head in and just transform melt completely uh decide to have his own kids yeah Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah because even the villain has to be redeemed that's right it's going to be a good family comedy right right? and maybe it ends up reforming the catholic church so their views on like celibacy and male men only you know not being able to have families and stuff and and it just it reverberates throughout the world there, yeah, and possibly a uh, gay theme involved somewhere mm-hmm. in this. Oh, well. without a doubt, without, without a, a doubt. doubt, because there so. there will then be like people who are within the Catholic Church who never felt like they could be themselves, right? And now these three kids who come in and they change things up, and now people are living their truth, you know. And right. and the Cardinal does not like all this. Why? So imagine is like a, a younger Tim Curry, yeah, exactly from Three Musketeers, right? right? I'm right. imagining Cardinal Richelieu, right? Someone with a face that you can just go, oh, that's the villain. That's yeah. the villain right there. There's a sequence where the eldest daughter needs to learn how to drive. How the Pope going to teach her to drive the Pope mobile, right? I mean, these are all things that are going to have to, you know, be part of it. Little brother like finds like where the communion wine has been stashed, and, and he's like totally. trying to sell it to kids and schools and stuff. And I see the little girl also saying that she doesn't like pasta. And, and so throughout the whole thing, they keep trying to give her different kinds of pasta, and she just doesn't like it, doesn't like it, doesn't like it. And it turns out she doesn't like pasta because her dad used to make little pasta shapes for Aww. her, and so it has to be like in the shape of a heart for her to eat the spaghetti, right? So <laughs> also the kid, the kids are Methodist. Also the kids are Methodist. <laughs> Methodist. Yeah. <laughs> I see the older sister like getting into the Pope's wardrobe and Mm. trying on a lot of the gowns and possibly the middle fuck up kid as well and showing up drunk from the communion wine in the middle of a service at some point. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh Or they he's he's about to start the service and the three kids aren't there. Right. And so then he's got to go find them and they're all sitting and watching TV and play video <laughs> games. And he's, you know, I don't know why I want to do the bad Italian accent, but like, you got to go ahead, you got to go to the church. And they're like, well, we, ne- we never go to church. Uh, but so this is my, if I ever got into a, a room to pitch a movie, I'd be like, you guys, 10 million bucks. You could do this thing. Super easy. Just, you know, get it done. Slice it together. Now, boom, who do it's you out see there. as the Pope? So it, it did used to be Andy Garcia. Okay. After, because in specifically Andy Garcia from that movie with Meg Ryan where she was an alcoholic. What's love? No, that's the Tina Turner one. Um, 
he played a dad and his wife was an alcoholic and he okay. showed a pretty awesome range okay as like being this concerned father but also not knowing what to tell his kids and i'm like andy that's what i want you to really grab at this point i can see the movie poster right now it's the pope wearing sunglasses and his arms crossed and then the kids are like this with their thumb pointed at him and there's like a blue sky with big red lettering for our father on top <laughs> right maybe it's written in clouds it's a real summer comedy <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's, I guess it's up in the air. Like we'll find out who needs a contract boost right. at that point and right. you know, who they, who they need to get one out. I mean, if Robert Downey Jr. will do a Dr. Doolittle reboot, maybe <laughs> we've got an opportunity here to really grab some, but then I started watching a show, Young Pope. Have you ever seen that show no. with Jude, Jude Law? Law? And I've been really intrigued by it, but it takes the idea of you know, kind of, you know, the, the Catholic church not having just an old white man as right. the, and so unfortunately it's sort of being done, but you can't take your kids to it. <laughs> so uh, he's learning a different lesson in that show yeah. over the, so what's it like over the years when someone has a passion project and they come to you and it is something that, you know, there must, there must've been people who just had ideas that just didn't seem fleshed out and just were not your cup of tea. You didn't get them. I remember hearing that uh, uh, the Star Wars was passed on by every studio until Alan Ladd Jr. finally said, we'll give this Lucas guy a chance. And so you must have in- interacted with those over the years. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But for me, honestly, it's my opinion i mean i'm not in the i'm not in the position to like bankroll something or not so it doesn't really matter (laughs) you know i mean i hate to blow down that question but if i don't like something it's just about huh you know maybe not the best idea see but but you're not blowing down that question isn't that a great way to take almost any creative endeavor though yeah just because this person says they don't like it doesn't mean it's not worthwhile right Right? Very true. I wanted yeah. to do an art installation years ago where I asked local notable people for their underpants <laughs> and then I'd put them in a shadow box <laughs> and the gallery was you'd see all these you know notable people's underpants and it was going to be a benefit for testicular cancer. <laughs> and so, you know, it doesn't have to be something that Mayor Mahoney pulled off of himself that very day. Right. It could he get to go just buy a pair of underwear, but it should sum up who you are. So I, <laughs> I've always kept on a, a pair of white boxer shorts with red polka dots on them because to me that is the classic comedy underpants. It is right. It is. I mean, hearts. Oh yeah. It's, and you can't find the heart ones as easily. Hard like, to find the Valentine's heart ones. Day, maybe. Yes. <laughs> but that was my thought: is if anyone ever asked me for a pair of my underpants, this is the one that it's going to be, right. you know? <laughs> right. But a lot of people in the art world who I've told that idea to, and I've gone to for helping, like, how do you get a gallery to, right. to get behind you, even for like a one night, have just kind of dismissed the idea, and it hasn't stopped me because it's just their opinion, right? Just because they don't get it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's weird, like, when you have an idea like that, you basically have to just go for it you know like depending on not depending on who cares about it or who wants to fund it like you know find some place to do it and just see if anybody shows up (laughs) and you know and the five people who do show up we're gonna have a hell of a good time that's right (laughs) yeah that's right (laughs) yeah things like that though i mean it's a great idea the idea of doing that as a benefit for (laughs) testicular cancer uh cracks me up in a sense that you'd have to find people who were both interested, both compassionate about cancer and ready to have a good laugh about it. Right. So, which would be the best. Uh, so I also want an afternoon where I am sitting in my living room with 40 pairs of underpants <laughs> and building shadow boxes specifically <laughs> for them. I think, you know, it, it, making sure to take plenty of photos so you can, you know, put together a sort of remembrance for how this thing came together. I feel is just as important. Right. Um, But you know, when they started bras on Broadway, right. That was, that was not you want me to build a bra out of old buttons and then do what with it. Right. And it became huge. Right. 
<laughs> so yeah. maybe the underpants movement <laughs> will get going. I also love the term underpants. I don't know what it is about saying that word underpants, <laughs> but so, a lot of people are like, uh, I think you mean like underwear or just boxers. And I'm like, no, I'm saying underpants. underpants. <laughs> That's what it is. It's your underpants. Um, yeah, I had uh, an ex long time ago who was also a playwright and wrote a play called Are These Your Panties? Which, to my mind, just people would have gone to see that play no matter what because mm-hmm. of its use of the word panties yeah. in the title. So, yeah. Do you ever find like, panties is one of those words where like people cringe at it? Like, they're, like think- moist is another one, too, <laughs> yeah. where when you say, oh, it was pretty moist, they kind of... <laughs> Bite back at it a little bit. I th- yeah, I think so. I mean, I think people cringe at panties because they're so conflicted because they're like, oh, panties, cool word. But then immediately they feel judged by themselves. Without a doubt. <laughs> Without, Without a, a doubt. doubt. I think that it ends with ease. <laughs> right. Like exactly. it's, it's, it's like kitties, puppies, <laughs> exactly. panties. Well, they don't, they don't belong together, <laughs> exactly. right? Like that don't, that work. I think it's part of it is, 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 is not. It, I mean, can't speak for everybody, but I think for a lot of people, it's the, just the sound itself. Right. For whatever reason, it it it, it triggers something for them. Yeah. And they're just like, it's Ugh. diminutive and cute. And yeah. Yet, and yet, you know what? And yet, it's horrible and transgressive. Right. And, you know, so people are conflicted about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes it's amazing how it boils down to the title. Yeah, that people just—it's the title—is what draws you in, or Completely. it sends you away. Completely. You know, I remember when my mom read *The Bridges of Madison County*. Mm. She read it because it had become such a, a popular thing amongst you know her friends and her peer group, and so she read it and she goes, "They should have named this something different because right. if it didn't grab a reviewer or whoever you know set this thing on its course to be so well read." it's not the type of book that when you're looking at it in the library, you think, Oh, the bridges of mass County." to me, that sounds like a book that was put together and it's pictures of, I mean, essentially what it is in the bridges of Madison County. It's a book of pictures of bridges <laughs> and it's the historical <laughs> record of this stone bridge was built in this year and was used By as Arthur a Custer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, not that everything needs to be like the time traveler's wife. You don't need <laughs> right. to hit me over the head with a title right. either. <laughs> right. Was uh, was are these your panties? Was it produced? Oh yeah, it yeah? was. It was a play. It went up at Theater Rhino, which is a small LGBT uh, content theater in San Francisco, and it did well. It started yeah. selling out. Yeah. It's got a great. It's got a great name, and once it you does. get them, once you get them in there, you just got to make sure they don't leave it intermission. That's right. You, you still have their money though. Yep. That's <laughs> they right. paid at the door. That's still got right. their money. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're getting to that time sure. where we round this thing up. If people are interested and they want to see some of your work, uh, is it available out there? It is. Yeah. I mean, I've got a few distributors, but. Uh, that's probably not the best way to find my work. So my work is distributed through Frameline and Canyon Cinema, but most probably the best place is I just have a website and some of that stuff is up there. Uh, I have uh, an in-name only production company that's called Density Over Duration and talk about bad titles. <laughs> I mean, that, I would never, the only reason I'm sticking with that is that I've had it for a while. It's like a horrible name for a production company. Um, but I have a website called densityoverduration.com, uh, which people can find it. So density over duration came out of, at one point I make mostly shorts. And at one point a friend asked me, why I wasn't making features, why I was just making shorts. And I said, well, I prefer density over duration. And she said, that should be your production company name. So I'm so gullible and easy to follow suggestion that that actually became <laughs> my production <laughs> company name. It's uh, it's not a good one, but it's still there. So yeah, densityoverduration.com. So, uh, sometimes it's just it's just getting it there and getting it done and right. you'll deal with it. And then the next 10 years, right? Right. <laughs> that's yeah. what I, that's what I always think. I've got a website 
that says like uh, you know, welcome to linebenders.com and it's got the date in it and it's like 2015 <laughs> and I've yet to re- uh, do anything with it and I just got a bad Google review from a guy <laughs> who said I went to their website and it's got the date 2015 on it. Well, it still has all my correct contact info and everything like that. But he's mad because I haven't updated anything on the site in four years. But I'm not going to. Now it's out of spite. Now it's like, <laughs> screw you, Benjamin Hurston. <laughs> you know, two stars. Are you kidding me, dude? Yeah, just claim it as art, right? You yeah, know, there you I go. I meant to do that. <laughs> yeah, I meant to do that. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Uh, Raymond, it's been a real pleasure talking with you this afternoon. A huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring this podcast. Folks, if you're looking to buy or sell a home, contact Natalie Deutsch today because Natalie Deutsch is not only a previous podcast guest, she's somebody who's going to care enough to sell your property for top dollar. She's also going to find you the best price possible if you're purchasing a new home. Last year on average, Natalie earned her clients $4,000 over list price on their homes and sold them faster than the market average. On average, Natalie's selling a home every 3.74 days. That's two homes a week. Those numbers don't lie. Find out why Natalie is one of the top agents in this entire market. Get a hold of her today, Natalie at HatchRealtyFM.com. You can also call 701-388-9338 or go on to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's LiveFargoMoorhead.com. Read all of her amazing reviews and then listen to her episode of JJ Meets World. Thanks again to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com, and you can find direct contact info for JJ. If I had to put them in order, it would be Fast and the Furious 7 as my number one. The first Fast and the Furious is my number two. Fast four, five, six. Then Fast three. The Hobbs and Shaw, and then the second, the Tokyo Drift. 